This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. Josh, I am so happy to tell you, you can go back to graduate school <laughs> and start over again. I'm sure they'd have you. I mean, let me be clear. I am not going to go back and start graduate school ever again. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we explore the great outdoors and share three T's of successful fieldwork. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 163. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Harneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Yo, Josh. I'm, I'm very excited to find out whether these microphones will pick up these crickets that we're listening to. That's right, Dan. Speaking of exploring the great outdoors, we are in the great outdoors right now at this moment. Yeah, we decided to get together and record outside because pandemics are still a real thing and uh, we're trying to be safe. But we've got this adorable little recording device that we can plug microphones into. So we figured, why not try it out and get a beer? Uh, I think you have a beer here that you split for us. You've got the can. I've got the glass. Yep. Uh, It's very seasonal, Dan. Fall is really the best time of year, in my opinion. And that is one reason we're out here. One, because of Delta variant. Two, because of this awesome weather. Three, because of our topic, field work. But Dan, this beer is appropriate for sitting outside on a cool fall night. This is the... Jack's Abbey Copper Legend Oktoberfest. Uh, it is not October at this moment we are recording, but I think by the time we release, it'll but, be yeah, almost Yeah, by the time October. people hear it, it will be October. <laughs> uh, so let me tell you about the marketing speak for this beer, Dan. Celebrate Oktoberfest with this malty, smooth, and exceedingly drinkable lager. Copper Legend is the perfect beer for creating legendary times with legendary people. Like you, Dan. Are you having a legendary time? You're checking time? all the boxes. This is legendary. <laughs> I will remember this like the other 15,000 times you and I have had a beer outside. And Dan, I wanted to let everyone know, Jack's Abbey Craft Loggers, this comes from Framingham, Massachusetts. And I was, my instinct was to call this um, Framingham, but I looked it up and it's uh, Framingham, You wanted to call it Framingham? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Framingham, Massachusetts. I know you have a lot of uh, beautiful art on your walls and, and lovely frams. <laughs> Those beautiful picture frams. All right. Enough of that. Uh, what do you think of the beer, Josh? Uh, I think it's great. I love an Oktoberfest. You know, I don't think I would love an Oktoberfest all year long, but some of my favorite intro craft beers when I first started appreciating beer uh, were were amber lagers, and I feel like the Oktoberfest harkens back to those days of drinking amber beers um, in my mind. I like, I like, I think this welcomes in the coming of the fall season for me. Yeah, I think it's a good one too. There's, there's a lot of flavor in this beer. It's not kind of a weak insipid lager. It's, it's got some bite to the back of it and they, they say malty and it is malty. So it's, it's pretty complex. Well, Dan, you will be glad to know that I picked this up at the beer store along with a host of other fall inspired beers that we will enjoy on the next few episodes. So look forward to that. I can't wait. IPA Free Fall is in effect. All right, Dan. Well, we wanted to say a quick thanks to our friends at Promega. In 2021, Promega is celebrating the 30th anniversary of bioluminescence as a tool for life science research. From illuminating protein interactions to giving us brighter tools for imaging, luminescent proteins have brought light to many different areas of research. When you're looking to study complex biological interactions, a bioluminescent reporter assay might be the tool you're looking for. Explore resources on bioluminescence and learn how it could be applied to your project. Just visit promega.com slash hellophd to learn more. And we'd also like to thank BioBox. Are you spending months learning how to use bioinformatic tools? Leverage the BioBox platform to process, analyze, and explore your genomic data without learning how to code. Accelerate your research and sign up for your 30-day free trial at biobox.io. All right, Dan, let's get on to our topic of the week. All 
right, Dan, I am really excited to hear this interview that you did with Dr. Sarah Vero about the three T's of successful field work. I'm excited to hear what they are. And you know, I love field work. You love field work and you love lists. So <laughs> let's hear what she had to say. Well, today I am joined by Sarah Vero. Uh, welcome to Hello PhD. Hi, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. And why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so people can uh, find out a little bit more about your background. Sure, absolutely. I am a lecturer in agricultural science at Waterford Institute of Technology in the south of Ireland, just on the coast. And my research looks at soil structure and water quality. But I spent some time in Kansas State University doing my postdoc. And before that, I was with Chagas, which is our agri-environmental research agency here in Ireland. So it's safe to say that your training and your research have not been confined to the laboratory environment. Is that fair? No, absolutely not. I've spent an awful lot of time uh, wandering across fields, uh, walking up rivers, sometimes splashing around in the same rivers, and really looking at where the lab meets the outdoors. Well, that's excellent. And that's what we're going to talk about today is some of the tools and tips and things that a scientist needs to know before they go out into the field. Uh, this may not be an experience that everybody listening has had, but I think by the end, if everybody, you know, if you keep listening through to the end, we're going to tie this back to maybe if you are in the laboratory, there are still some strategies you can employ. So why don't we start with uh, what is field research and, and who does it? Because it sounds like you're talking about fields and rivers and a lot of other places. So can you narrow it down for us or broaden yeah, it maybe? Absolutely. Sure. So I suppose a lot of our listen, your listeners here, they're from all different aspects of scientific research and of PhD research. And for a lot of us, when we think of research, we think of the laboratory, we think of the white coat, we think we might think of computer modeling either, but it all tends to be we think of indoor activities. But for many fields of research, whether that's geography, agronomy, environmental science, marine science, ecology, geology, all of these people have to work in the outdoors. So when I say field, I don't necessarily mean a farmer's field with rows and rows of corn or beet or whatever. When I say field, I just mean the outdoors, the real environment, the real world. So it doesn't matter if you're up a mountain in the Himalayas or if you're in a cornfield in the Midwest, it's all the field. So really the field is where what we see in the lab, the scientific principles play out in reality. And it's much more complicated than the laboratory in many ways, and we have much less control. So the challenge that we face as field researchers is to bring the scientific principles of control and experimental design into an environment that's just very difficult to control. And I suppose that's where, you know, really having soft skills of planning and logistics really show their true importance. It's you trying to complete difficult experiments with or against mother nature, right? It, things yes. you do not get to control uh, in the outdoors. Can you, can you help me understand, is there field work that is experimental in nature where you are setting up experiments that run outdoors or is it purely observational where I'm collecting samples and then taking them back to analyze them? That's a really great question. Yeah, there's different types of field work. So as you say, there's some... Uh, in some instances, we're doing fieldwork just to provide the raw materials, the soil or the plant or the water materials that we take back to the lab where we can exert our own controls on it. But in many cases, we're running trials such as crop trials out in the field where we set up a plot like a, like a, a replicated plot design and we will return and take measurements and record observations and even apply treatments over a prolonged period, sometimes many, many years. Um, a lot of aquatic studies uh, whether that's freshwater or marine, involves setting up instrumentation that can run for decades, in wow. fact. Yeah. And then, of course, we have case studies where it mightn't be a controlled trial per se, but you are going out to document in reality what's happening, subject to some environmental uh, or anthropogenic intervention. I can't imagine being the grad student on a decades-long study. I hope the, the graduate student gets to graduate before that's complete. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, I suppose there's, and not to go too off tangent, because long-term field trials are a whole other story, but with the environment, because things happen in nature very, very slowly, um, 
the longer the study is, usually the more valuable the data is. And I can give an example. The River Thames in England is the river that's had the most prolonged measurement in the whole world. I think it's something like 150 years. And Rothamsted Research Farm in Devon has been running field trials for, I think it's 75 years. So the data just becomes more and more powerful. But of course, you'll have PhD and graduate students who will step in and out and do smaller projects nested within that long-term research program. I see. That makes me feel better that they're not stuck there for 75 <laughs> years of a graduate training program. <laughs> Think it, of the experience. Exactly. <laughs> now, you mentioned that there are some challenges that are associated with field research that may not be the same as, as I would experience in a laboratory. Can you talk about some of those and uh, about some of the training that a researcher might need or maybe they receive it, maybe they don't for going out and sure. doing those types of trials? Sure. Well, I suppose, I mean, the core of the challenge comes from trying to exp apply scientific principles uh, to a setting that's just so implicitly heterogeneous and that's so complicated. So you can't always isolate factors to the same degree that you would in the laboratory. So it takes a lot of, I suppose initiative and a lot of planning to figure out how you might do that. It takes a very strong understanding of statistics to say, well, is this statistically significant or not in light of all the confounding and conflicting factors? But as well as that, you just have to deal with natural challenges in your environment. So think of it, it's a little bit like crossing the lab with camping. So you have to think of how am I going to deal with the weather? How am I going to deal with challenges with the instruments? How am I going to deal with wildlife and a lack of access to facilities and the support that you might have in the lab or the university? So it's kind of a cross section of the very scientific and the very, very practical. As for training, it's mixed. You know, some people might do a feat, what's called a field course as part of their undergrad. And that usually means that your instructor or your, your lecturer, your professor will take you out to a field site and you might stay for a number of days and you'll take do some ex small experiments and it'll be all very, very supervised and subject to a lot of demonstration. But you know yourself from doing a PhD, that's not how it is in the lab. You don't have someone holding your hand and looking over your shoulder the whole time. You're kind of left to figure it out. And in my experience, that's often the case with PhD students doing field research in that you can get someone to teach you, I mean, the hard techniques. In other words, how do I use X device or how do I take Y measurement? Right. But no one usually trains you in the planning and the logistics and the sample management. All those soft skills are really what make you successful. So, yeah, that's often can be a little bit lacking. Sometimes you'll be lucky and you'll get a really good postdoc who will work through it with you. But more often than not, there's quite a steep learning curve. Yeah, I didn't take any field research classes or courses in, in college or in graduate school, but I think the experience of taking a chemistry lab or something like that is very familiar. Yeah. In, in the cl lab class, the answer is known. The, you follow the steps, you create the compound that you were told to create, most people are able to get through it, but it's so different in, in an active research lab where there are no roadmaps for, for getting there. Yeah. And so you sink or swim on the support of the people around you and your ability to get help if people are not offering it to you. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, uh, I mean, you can often get an SOP for how do you take a sample but there is no SOP for you arrived on site and there was a bull in the field or you arrived on site and the rain was just torrential and you have to decide, do I go ahead and take samples or do I postpone it for the other for another day? Those are kind of unknowns and, and you get very expert. One of the good things about field work is you get very, very expert at decision making and handling unknown situations. But it's very, very daunting and intimidating for someone um early on in their field research career. And I would say, just in case I'm not clear sometimes, being new to field research doesn't mean you're new as a researcher. Some people right. do field research very early when they're at undergrad level. And then some people mightn't do that until beyond even their postdoc. So you can be an experienced researcher, but not an experienced field researcher. So you have to allow yourself, give yourself a little bit of sympathy and allow yourself to recognize, even though you might be doing science for many, many years, this is a 
new and challenging environment to you. That's a, and that's a great distinction because I think you can have years of research, exactly as you said, but not this particular wedge uh, of research. I would love to see the laboratory yeah. class the, or the field research course, but the extreme version where they actually put a bull in the field as the students go out <laughs> and then they teach you how to deal with that. I think the liability might be out of bounds. But um, So you've got these three, what you call the three T's of successful field work. And this is yeah. a, just a framework for people listening to help them think ahead before they go out into the field. Here is what I need to prepare myself for. So can you talk us through the three T's? Sure. So I thought there's lots of things that make someone successful in, in field research or in any real re- research for that matter. But when I sat down to think about it and organize my, my approach, you can really boil it down to these three things. It's your tools, your team, and your time. And if you can manage each of these three categories, you should be well set up for success when it comes to field research. So shall we start with tools? Absolutely. Um, I suppose you have tools in the laboratory or in uh, desk-based research as well. But when you come to field research, it tends to be quite equipment heavy because you, you, you often have multiple different tasks going on at the same time. And you don't have the resources that you have in the laboratory. So there's not, a, you know, a, a desk that's full of spare pipettes and lab gloves and everything else. You have to think of all of these things in advance and bring them with you because they just won't be there in the natural environment. Or I've yet to discover the lab glove tree. So you have to bring all of your tools <laughs> with you. I, I've not seen that one either. And I've seen a lot of trees. <laughs> This this reminds me a little bit of when I start a home improvement project, it's something simple maybe, and I grab a screwdriver out of the garage and I walk upstairs to to start, you know, maybe replacing a light or something. And then I realize after I get up there, I'm going to need pliers. So I go back down for pliers and I come back upstairs and I'm like, really, I should have gotten my electrical tester. So I go back down. So, so anyway, I will make 10 trips back and forth because I haven't taken the time to do what you're saying here, which is think through the process and identify these tools in advance. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I mean, in some cases you might be within, you know, an hour's drive of your lab, in which case it's not the end of the world if you forgot your multi-parameter probe or, you know, whatever else. But I know plenty of people who do research, which is several days drive away from the, from their headquarters. And the idea of going back is is not just out of the question, it's impossible. It couldn't be done. Um, So I try and I'm a big list maker. You know, I think if you make a list, you can pretty much identify what's going to come up ahead of you. I I divide field equipment into three subcategories. So you have your task specific tools, you have your consumables, and then you have what I call your everyday carry. So for task specific tools, These are the tools that you will need to do each of the individual jobs you will do in the field. So think about it. If you're going to run a field trial, let's say, let's say it's a crops trial. On any given day, you might have to take soil samples, apply a fertilizer treatment or a chemical treatment to the crops. You might have to take crop measurements and then you might have to take um, weather measurements or you might have to service your data loggers or something like that. Each of those tasks has completely different tools. Um, So what I start by doing is I make a list of the tasks that I want to conduct on that day. And then for each of those tasks, I list out all of the tools that I'm going to need. So very, very specifically. And that's useful because the task based approach, you may find out you need a tape measure on three or four of your tasks. But if you don't list it out by tasks and you just say, I just need a tape measure, you have not thought through the entire process for while you're there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we tend, everyone gives more mental space to the tasks that we think are particularly important or particularly challenging. And you don't want servicing the data logger to be an afterthought to everything else, because at the end of the day, you want all of your data to be of an adequate standard and and of good quality. So you can't allow there to be holes in your data as a result of you less prioritizing the less urgent tasks. And it's great. This this list sounds very reusable, too. If I go out again next yeah. month, I don't have to start from scratch thinking through. And in fact, I can add on the things I probably forgot the first time. So by the end of three or four years of doing this, 
I probably have a very complete list I can pass down to the next student that says, here's what you need to bring with you. The, you know, the, yeah. the bull spray, the, <laughs> it could be a, a number of things that they would never think of. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think you're 100% correct about passing on that information. And that's one of the things that's most overlooked in field research is the knowledge transfer to the next generation, because you don't want the next person to be starting from, from scratch. We should each build on the knowledge and also on, on the tools and facilities that the last person left behind. Uh, I would also say when it comes to the task specific tools, uh, two pieces of advice. Number one, if you haven't done a task before, if you haven't conducted a specific measurement, try and do a trial run before you go to the field, because then you'll know, oh, actually, I, I needed to have a sharp blade for taking that sample or, you know, I actually needed, you know, a, a spare set of screws or something like that. You want to know that before you go. And also, if it's your first time, try to talk to somebody who's done that measurement before, just like you would for doing a task in the lab. And it was something I have done a, a couple of times, actually, if I'm doing a task in the field that I haven't done before and I, either I don't know the technique terribly well or I don't know if I'll need certain tools is you can reach out to people who have done that analysis or done that measurement before. I mean, if you've read somebody's paper and you see that they use a particular tech, particular technique, don't be shy about reaching out to them for advice. In my experience, people are uh, very willing to say, don't leave home without such and such or make sure you do whatever, you know, but people can pass on that information to you and just leave you a little bit more prepared for the task at hand. That's great. And I think that's so important for the uh, the replication of the, the measurements or the experiments. You don't want to be introducing a lot of uh, user error because you're doing it yeah. differently from the postdoc who went last month. And so really coordinating on that. And, and maybe we'll talk about that when, when we get to team. But yeah. the idea that you can reach out for help and get advice. And, and I like, love what you said, which is practice the technique before you get out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, I mean, even if things go perfectly according to plan, it's always easier to do it at home next to the lab where you have backup and you have someone else to check your work than when you're out there by yourself. And you can't, you're under time pressures and environmental pressures as well. That's that's great. So what do you mean by consumables? I don't, I don't think you mean, you know, the beer that you take in the cooler out to the research site. No, but I will come to those later when we talk <laughs> okay, about the everyday carry. Uh, when it comes to consumables, you're really talking about anything that is either used up completely or that is contaminated in the process of your analysis. So it's anything that you might use only once during your experiment or your, your field trip. So it, that includes things like syringes, sample bags, boxes. It also includes certain PPE like gloves or masks. So anything that you're really only going to use once. There's a saying that I heard a while ago, and I think it's really relevant, that goes, two is one and one is none. So going out with only one of, if you say, well, like I only need one lighter, no, nope. that's not going to be good enough. You want to have a spare because if the piece of equipment or the consumable fails you, you need to have backup. The other thing I would say is if you're taking samples in the field, often you get an opportunity to take extra samples. So, for example, I work a lot in soil science and one of the activities we do a lot is called profiling. And profiling is where you dig a soil pit and you look at the different horizons, we call them, the different mm -hmm. layers of soil and you characterize them. Sometimes you might dig deeper than you expected, or sometimes there might be more horizons than you expected. If you don't have adequate consumables, adequate sample bags, adequate bulk density rings and a spare, you might miss out on the opportunity to take these additional samples and they can be absolutely crucial. So you always want to have more consumables than you anticipate. And the other thing I would say is, you have to bring all your consumables back with you. Just because you've used something doesn't right. mean you can abandon it. You know, it's it's the leave no trace principle is very much at play when it comes to field work. You want to leave the site in the condition that you arrived to it at in the beginning. There shouldn't be a pile of pipette tips by the stream bank or anything like that. Yeah. And and yeah. So carrying everything in means carrying everything out and having a plan for keeping those the clean and the dirty separate and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's 100% correct. And the other 
thing that's to keep in mind when it comes to consumables is, you know, remember, we're, we're trying to bring the laboratory principles into the field. So for chemicals, for reagents, for anything that's biologically active, you might want to remember that these things have a they have a lifespan. Those reagents mightn't be able to be used forever or there might be specific um, storage and handling requirements Absolutely. such as chilling. And keeping samples cool or keeping reagents cool, uh, getting to the field is a lot more challenging than it is moving from one lab to another, for an example. So you would want to have a plan for how you're going to handle uh, these supplies. And keeping things dry, I can imagine, is is challenging. So it's not just our, our tools and our consumables that we carry. It's the method to keep those stable and active. Uh, so... I assume you put this all in your same task list where you say, here's here's my task. Here are the yeah. tools I need specifically. Here are the consumables I need. And then here's how I'm going to transport them. Is that part of that process? That's exactly right. So I would create, you can do it in Excel quite simply, or I have some templates on my website where you have different categories for your tools, for your task, sorry, for your task, for your tools, and for your consumables. So you can map it out quite simply. And it it seems self-evident once you've done it, but if you haven't gone through this in a structured sort of a plan, you're liable to go wrong. And the other thing I would say, you you said stable, and that um, is something that always, you know, is quite important when it comes to sample management. Remember, if you're taking samples in the field, whether that's, you know, plant or animal samples, whether it's soil samples, whether it's geological samples, they're kind of bulky. Uh, They're not little vials usually. Usually you're talking about boxes, bags, crates. You're going to need more space in your vehicle on the way back than you usually did on the way out. And this is some I've seen people try to like shove bags of grass and bags of leaves into the back of cars. And you're like, hmm, this is... maybe wasn't planned ideally. So think about how you're going to transport your samples and keep them preserved during the transportation stage. That's great. Yeah, that would not have occurred to me, but you're right. If I'm collecting soil samples, I need somewhere to put those before I get back to the lab. Um, The third item on your list is is what you call everyday carry. And so that is not so obvious to me what that means. Can you describe that one? Sure. So your everyday carry is the items that you always bring with you, irrespective of what the task is. So if these are not task specific tools, they're just things that you really shouldn't be leaving home without. So, you know, when I'm going to the shops or whether I'm going to the cinema, I always bring my purse, I always bring my keys, I always bring my glasses. And this is a little bit like that. It doesn't matter whether I'm going to install a data logger in a river or whether I'm going to, you know, set up field trials uh, on a research farm. There's certain things I'll never leave the lab without. And it's very good for people to figure out what are the things they use all the time. But for me, I always have a multi-tool because you can repair things, you can cut things, you can hold things together. It's just a useful thing to have. Always have zip ties and duct tape because no idea how useful they are. Yeah, whether it's for fixing up a piece of equipment or whether it's, you know, to seal a sample bag, it's just essential. Uh, Sharpies or other permanent markers. There's no point taking samples that you can't label. Everyone's experienced that in the lab, you know, or that you can't label clearly. A flashlight or a headlamp. Remember, if you're in the environment, the outdoor environment, that is, when it gets dark, you can't turn the light on. There's nothing you can do about that. And a flashlight or a headlamp, can not only give you an extra hour or two of sampling if you need it, but it also is crucial for your safety. And speaking of safety, you should always have a first aid kit. Uh, The other things that should be in your everyday carry are clothing and food and drink. There's no canteen. There's no Starbucks. There's if you're outside, you could be quite a distance from somewhere that you can get food and drink. Uh, You might be staying overnight camping. That's very, very common. And you, you want to make sure that you're sufficiently fed and sufficiently hydrated. There's really, really good research from the National Institute of Occupational Health showing huge, huge um, personal impacts, negative physical impacts. If you're dehydrated, you can become tired, you can become disoriented. And really, you have to take that very, very seriously in, in the field. It can become dangerous. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we give a lot of attention during our working day to making sure people have access to suitable facilities and access to food and drink and that they can rest. 
And sometimes we overlook that in the outdoors, but it's really, really a, a, a significant issue. And, you know, it, it changes something from being quite a challenging experience to quite a fun experience. It's, you know, it, it's nice to be able to sit down with your teammates in a nice outdoors location and relax and it can kind of take the stress out of the day because it is sometimes a stressful experience. I would also say when it comes to clothing, if you're outdoors, if you're working in rivers, if you're working in fields, if you're just hiking to a remote location, you're going to be sweaty, you're going to be dirty, you might get damp. Always bring spare clothes because it's uh, it's healthier, it's cleaner, and it'll just give you, a, I suppose, a, a better experience on the day. It's really, really quite important. Yeah, there, there are a few things more miserable than going to bed damp. I mean, it's just... Yeah, absolutely. Just not pleasant. Okay, well, so now we have our tools and we've made a checklist... We have thought ahead about uh, the tasks that we're going to be doing. We have asked people for their advice. Maybe somebody looks over my list and says, oh, you're missing these three things. We've got our consumables. We've got our everyday carry. Now we're ready to go. Is that is that all we need? Or can we talk about the second T? The, The final thing I would say about being ready to go and when it comes to your tools is it's a really good idea to have a go bag. So just rather than waiting for field work to happen, if you can set all these things up in a bag or in a crate, that means you can simply move them into your field work vehicle when you're ready to go. It can save you a lot of time and a lot of mismanagement. Environmental research often involves, you know, responding to weather events or responding to, uh, you know, any something that has happened in the field. It's, it's uh, event-based sampling is very, very common. If you're not ready to go, you might miss that opportunity. So I'd say is, Make these lists and put these plans in place early so that when the opportunity for fieldwork happens, you can just deploy without a whole lot of, you know, running around trying to make these lists at short notice when you mightn't be thinking as clearly. And so that's a go bag with my task specific tools. And yes. it's one at home with my clothes and my flashlights and my multi tools in a duffel bag in the exactly. back of the closet. But when the call comes, I'm ready to go. That's exactly right. Excellent. Well, let's talk about team, the second T. Sure. Well, team is really, really crucial in field work. And it's a really a two-way street because on one ha- the one hand, having a good team is very, very important to successfully conducting your field research. But as well as that, field research is a great way to develop a tight and cohesive team and individual teamwork skills. So, you know, it's a a synergistic sort of a thing. You need a team, but also you get better at being in a team through fieldwork. To do fieldwork, you need a number of different elements present in your team. So again, I'm dividing it into three different categories. You're going to need certain skills. You're going to need to fulfill certain labor requirements. And you're going to need to consider the availability of personnel. So when we talk about skills, as we've kind of outlined in our discussion so far, field research involves an awful lot of different abilities. You're going to need someone who can probably drive. You're going to need someone who has experience with equipment. You're going to need someone who is able to apply certain treatments. And these might all be the same person, or you might need several people all with these individual skills. So, for example, if you need a crop to be harvested and then you need someone else who's going to do a soil pit, well, they might not be the same person. So you might need to consider that and you need to sit down with your team or with your supervisor and say, well, these are, go back to your task list. These are the four tasks I have to do. And do we have people with each of those skills? If you don't, you might need to recruit someone in for that specific day. So, for example, uh, I was setting up data loggers on Kanza Prairie in Kansas as part of my postgraduate or my postdoctoral research. And uh, I wasn't so familiar with the soil series there. I'd be much more familiar with the Irish uh, soil types. So we got a pedologist who's an expert in soil profiling to come with us for a day of field work. So that's often the case. You'll have to, you know, sub in someone with a specific set of skills. They might not be with you for the whole field campaign, but you'll need them for a period of time. That makes sense. And I think even if a person has the skills you need, they may be required to be doing another task that they have the yeah. skills for. And both tasks have to happen at the same time. And so you really do have to think about, uh, as you said, two is one and one is none. Maybe having two people that can do uh, something really critical is 
yeah. important. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just because you don't have the skills isn't the end of the world. I mean, it's a field work is a great opportunity to learn skills and you can use the buddy system where you pair up with someone who's a little bit more experienced and they can teach you how to take certain measurements or how to use certain tools. And we do this in the lab in a very informal way all the time. You can say, oh, someone else is very good at pipetting or someone else is very familiar with titration. Can they walk you through the steps? Right. There's no reason you can't do that with field research as well. It's all about knowledge transfer and sharing your abilities. And, and make that your goal to pick up something new each time. I think that'd be a, a great uh, thing to try to do each trip. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and that's one of the good things about field research is at the end of a campaign, you should have accumulated quite a few skills uh, uh, by the end of it, it's invariably it's a real learning experience. The next thing I would usually consider are the labor requirements. Field research is it's quite physically demanding. You know, there's often an awful lot of different tasks to do in a very short window. And the window of time is often outside of your control. It could be in response to the weather or could be in response to the growing period of a certain crop. So you really have to be very, very good at time management. And even if you are highly motivated and an excellent planner, sometimes it's just not physically possible to do a certain number of measurements within a small window of time. So I can give you an example. A few years ago, I was leading a research team doing large scale surveys of river networks. We were doing four different river networks and we had to take hundreds of samples within a very small time window. And even if I was sprinting, there was no way I was going to take all of those measurements. Just physically but impossible. It was very, totally impossible. It could never happen. So what we, I did was it wasn't a very difficult type of technique. I was able to get five or six people from my research institute and they were all able to meet on a specific day I ran through the technique and I assigned each of them certain sampling points and we were all able to simultaneously independently take the measurements and then come back together and pool our samples. So th that's an example of, of labor requirements. You just need enough people to get the job done, even if the ta specific task isn't terribly challenging. So don't try to do it all yourself. There's no, it's not a case of heroism. No one thinks any less of you if you need help. You simply need more hands to do the job sometimes and don't be shy about, you know, reaching out. It's just a practical and a pragmatic concern. I assume you've seen that where people want to do it all themselves and they don't feel comfortable asking. So that's why you're emphasizing this. I, I can imagine that being a motivation. Uh, I just... I don't want to burden anybody or I want to show that I'm working really hard. But the reality is get the help. Yeah, absolutely. And we can just even now after years of doing it, I can still fall into that trap sometimes. You think, oh, no, I can manage or I don't really need help. Well, maybe even if you can manage at what cost, you know, are you putting yourself at risk? Are you compromising the quality of your samples? You know, you kind of have to it, it can be a bit of an egoistic endeavor sometimes you think no i am the independent lone wolf researcher and i'm going to go out and do this it's like why you're also robbing other people of the opportunity to take part and be part of the team and maybe contribute maybe they'll be able to contribute to such a degree that they can be on the publication if it's that sort of research but also the opportunity to learn skills so if you're a phd student for example and there's an undergraduate or a master's student in your research group Maybe they'd appreciate the opportunity to go out and learn how to use an infiltrometer or, you know, how to do a quadrat sample or whatever your particular skill and ability is. Yeah, that, that is such great advice. And that gets a little bit to the third point here, which is the availability of personnel. I assume yeah. not everybody can have their go bag ready at a moment's notice. And so how do you manage that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so researchers and just people in general have many different commitments and they're both professional commitments. You know, if you're a researcher, you're often working on more than one project at a time and personal commitments. You know, we, we all have families, we all have loved ones, we all have friends and we all have just lives that we ought to be getting on with. And just because it's one person's, it's their field day is coming up and it's the most important thing and they have this narrow window and doesn't mean it's equally important to everyone at that specific right. moment of time. You may have other c commitments. 
you know, you can't expect your supervisor or the postdoc or the technician or whoever else just to be able to drop everything and come with you for field research. So it's really important to have a discussion in advance of your field campaign saying what sort of time do you anticipate is going to be needed? How long is each individual field trip going to be? And who can or is willing to take part in field work? And maybe you need to develop a sort of a shared calendar so that people can make known their availability. What I would say is usually if you're in a research group where there are other PhD students, people will help each other out. So just because you, you know, you really wanted X person to do it and be with you on that day, your friend can also help help you out and maybe you can pay back the favor and you know it's it's a what would be the word it's about negotiation and and being amenable to helping other people and that's that's really really important but what I would say is if someone's not available you've got to be respectful of other people's time and commitments and uh, figure out another way don't just make an assumption that someone is going to be there not because they don't necessarily want to be but just we all have multiple obligations. It does sound to me like field research by by its nature, by the requirement, it is very collaborative and collegial that you need to work as a team. I'm, maybe there are examples where you go out in the field by yourself as the lone wolf, as you, as you said, but it, it sounds to me like for safety's sake, for getting all the work done in a very narrow amount of time, you have to go with other people. And so managing this team... It feels like it's a little bit unique to field research, and I and I think it could be a really valuable uh, skill to develop. Yeah, and I mean, look, sometimes we do go into the field by ourselves on a specific date or on, to do a specific task, but there's always a much wider team behind the scenes. Your team might include the lab staff who are going to receive your samples. It might include the landowner who's giving you access to the site. So really, there's a very wide network of people you're going to need to liaise with and consult with. And I suppose some of the things that I like to think about is how can you be a good team member? And remember, if you're, if you're, when I, we speak about field research, we've, we've been talking so far, mostly in the context of you are a PhD researcher doing field research that will eventually lead to your thesis or dissertation and eventually to your doctorate. But equally... You might not be the lead of that field research. You might be a team member and you're there to support others and to help them in their project, not your own project. And depending on your role within the team, there are different skills and different considerations that you might need to take into account. So regardless of whether you're the leader or a team member, communication, I think, is probably the the aspect that you should be prioritizing. And that means really communicating back and forth about your plans, being clear about what is needed, about what's happening in the moment, what's expected. Regardless of where you are in a team, you should be realistic about what can be achieved with respect to the individual goals. And you should be always seeking to pull your weight and really contribute to the best of your ability. And then also, as we discussed earlier, to ask for and to offer help and just to be a good team member. You know, you should you should treat others on your team the way you would expect to be treated. And the other thing I would say is, particularly if you're a team leader, is to be decisive. Even if there are multiple people contributing, someone has to make decisions and take responsibility. The book has to stop with someone. And that's usually the team leader who's ever who's ever research project it is. And a lack of being able to make decisions can really hamper a team much more than help it. Have you seen that happen? Can you do you have a, an example of where that decisiveness mattered? Well, I can definitely say in my own experience from the early days of my PhD, I didn't have a huge amount. I had some field experience, but in a very controlled sort of field trial. And now I was doing something that was much more environmental monitoring. And I just found the beginning could be quite overwhelming. There were so many different devices to choose between. There was such an issue about how to choose your sample site and your sampling date that I just found myself a little bit overwhelmed. And I probably delayed actually getting into the field for too long. And with a little bit more confidence, I would have been able to say, no, these are the equipment I'm going with. These are my sites and move ahead. And it's very, very hard to do when you're in your early days. But that's a really important thing for someone who's going to go on 
on to an independent research career. It's a great skill to be able to learn. But definitely, if you're a very junior researcher, that decisiveness, you just mightn't have the confidence or the experience. And I have to, you know, salute my PhD supervisor and other PhD supervisors that encourage their students to do that because it stands to you in the long run. Yeah, that's great. And that is a skill that you will have to develop and will come as you gain confidence, you gain certainty yeah. about the research, you start to recognize the impacts of indecision, that, that window yeah. of time does close. So I think that's something for listeners to be focused on, to, to think about, am I willing and able to make these decisions? And if not, you know, what would help me gain confidence to, to get better at yeah. that? I think that's great. You know, we see this in the lab as well all the time. This is how, you know, things feed back and forth to one another. We see it in the lab, too, where people can be, you know, a bit anxious about taking a certain approach or they can be reluctant to learn new techniques or to make a decision about where the project yeah, has to go. And very familiar. Really, yeah. And doing as, as we're, whether you're doing a, pro, uh, a research project in the general sense or whether you're a PhD student, we only have a set amount of time and resources. So a failure to make decisions just eats into those and you can't do that forever. Well, speaking of time, that is our third T. Why don't you tell us about what, what time, the time management aspect of field work looks like? Yeah, field research is rarely a nine to five thing. I know lab work can certainly run on into late nights and early mornings, but field research really it's it's on another level. So and if you don't manage your time carefully, it can run over terribly and it can run over not just on the day, but across weeks and across seasons. And you really don't want that to happen. So being trained in research, I like to break things down and have an equation. So I developed an equation for managing your time in field research. So the first thing you need to account for is travel time. How long is it going to take you to get from your research center or your home to the field site? And that's going to With all of your equipment. Exactly. With all of your equipment, all of your consumables, and with probably a coffee stop along the way. So, you know, you have to include your driving time, but also hiking and deployment time. Like how long does it take to get from wherever you park to the actual sampling site? That can often be quite a distance. You can calculate these things, Google Maps or other route planning software, but you should have a ballpark idea. Is this a 40 minute drive or is this an overnight trip? So that's the first thing you need to figure and, out. And I'm I, you know, just thinking through the process, you talked a little bit about all of the materials we have to take. And if I have to hike miles upstream and then I yeah. have to carry my samples out and all of my my wasted consumables and all of those things, this this is not like a <laughs> a quiet stroll through the woods necessarily. This could be a strenuous Rarely. hike. <laughs> Absolutely. And this, you know, you make a good point about coming back. After your field work, whether it's sampling or whether it's applying a treatment, you're going to be more tired on your return than on your way out. And this is something um, you really need to take into account, particularly in your driving. Tiredness is a leading cause of road accidents. So you're going to need to take into account the, the element of fatigue that you're going to accumulate as your field work day or campaign rolls on. OK, so we start with our travel time. That's our first time in the equation. The next thing is your setup time. So once you arrive on site, how long does it take to set up your devices, lay out your treatments, prepare yourself? In other words, prepare your workstation that you'll use in the field. And this mightn't actually be that long, depending on how prepped you can be before you deploy. But you are going to need a lot of time. Like you don't, you couldn't say, well, I'm going to be on site at 12 and at 12.02, I'm going to start taking measurements. That's not really realistic. So you want to allow a little bit of time uh, in that area. And, you know, the more you do your field research, you'll be able to get a kind of a better handle on how long it takes for you to actually set up your equipment and get ready to go. Do you recommend that people front load that as much as possible? Like, should I be labeling my tubes and my bags yeah. and, and putting everything in order before I get there? Yeah, 100%. That's a very, very practical step. If you can label your sample bags, your sample boxes, if you can pre-charge your treatments. So let's say you know you have to apply four different fertilizer treatments. If you can weigh them out in the lab, label each of the bags and have them stacked in order that you want to apply them, all of that can cut down on your setup time. 
Great. What's next? So the next thing is treatments and measurements. So this is how long does it actually take you to apply your treatments and take your samples. And again, this is really going to vary depending on how many treatments and how many measurements you need to do on a given day. So you are going to need to calculate that in advance. And if you've done a trial run of of taking a measurement or a trial run of applying a treatment, you should know, well, it takes me 10 minutes to take X amount of soil samples or to harvest such and such a quadrat of foliage, then you'll be able to calculate. It's kind of a back of an envelope calculation, but it'll still give you a good guide on how long your treatments and measurements ought to take. And it's probably going to be the bulk of your field work should be made up of those two. Excellent. And then those are some of the things that we prepared for. You've got some things next in the equation that maybe people didn't prepare for. So tell us about the next one. So the next one is something that I used to overlook an awful lot. And I think people in general overlook a lot. It's rest. You're not an auto sampler. You're not a machine. You know, you can't just go without a break. So the same principles of rest that you use when you're working in the lab or working in the office should apply in the field. Plus a little extra to consider how physically demanding it can often be. And You might push through to get a certain sample done if you know that rain is coming in and the water level is going to rise. Or You might occasionally push through, but that shouldn't be your standard approach. You should have rest periods. You should sit down and take a break. Make sure you eat. Make sure you rest adequately because there's a physical toll and a psychological toll for not doing so. Being in the sun, uh, you know, can... Yeah. Take more energy out of you than you believe hiking, uh, hiking with things on your back. And and these are things that maybe people have have practiced. Maybe they are avid hikers, but maybe not. Maybe when they go out and do their field research, this is a a unique experience uh, for them physically. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you have to keep in mind that it's very demanding. You're being asked to do something that is physically a little bit demanding and mentally hugely demanding at the same time. So, you know, you, you should, and, and you're, of course, you're exposed to the elements. Uh, so you should, don't be surprised if you find yourself very tired. You are going to be tired. And if you want to be successful, you're going to need to manage that tiredness, just like you'd manage any other aspect of your experiment. So plan for rest, put it, put it directly exactly. into the equation. There's one final element, one final term yes. in this equation. So the final term, and it might be a frustrating one, but it's the unexpected. You don't know what delays, setbacks, accidents, or just unexpected elements are going to come into play on the day of fieldwork. So you're not going to be able to give a specific length of time that you leave to the unexpected, but you don't want to fill up your day or fill up your campaign of fieldwork with so little flexibility, so little buffer space in it, that if something goes wrong or if something just unusual or unanticipated happens, that you actually think, oh, I have no capacity to deal with this. And that was one of the things, you know, I I remember showing my PhD supervisor my plan for field research and he goes, but you left no space. Like he goes, what if, you know, the trailer breaks down? What if somebody's late? What if you spill your samples and you have to take them again? And he was 100% correct. I'd left no, no fat, no extra in the day. So you always want to make sure that you're not scheduling your work with so little flexibility that you can't adapt. That's great. Yeah. I think everybody has experienced this who has tried to be on time for something. You know, you, you schedule the babysitter to arrive at this hour and you know, you've got the map on Google maps that tells you how long it's going to be. And the event starts at four. Well, guess what happens when there's traffic? (laughs) <laughs> doesn't you know yeah, exactly. you didn't, didn't leave room for any of these unexpected things and now you're late because you didn't have buffer yeah exactly so it's just about giving yourself a little bit more forgiveness within the day to deal with things as they come up as they always do in all of our general lives you just don't want to be 100 miles from home when it happens and you know if you don't need that extra time that's great. Maybe you get home a little bit early or maybe you can stop for a coffee and an ice cream along the way. All of those are good things. I would rather have that time than not have it. Yeah, that's wonderful. So we've got travel time, setup, measurements, rest, and the unexpected. And that should get us to, 
we we at least need to think about all of those things as we're coming up with a plan for yeah. uh, our research site. Yes, exactly. So that gives you a broad idea of how long you're going to need and how you ought to be dividing up that time. And it'll also, you might look at it and say, wow, that's, you know, it's an awful lot for one part, the driving on top of the measurements, really, you know, and you might need to review your plan and say, well, maybe I need to split this into two days, or maybe I need an extra member of staff with me. Once you see things written down in terms of the time they, they, they take, you can be a little more, realistic about whether it's achievable or not. If everything looks achievable from your desk, it's a it's another matter when you actually go to do it. And this will help you anticipate what it's going to be like in reality. I, I want that embroidered on a sampler. Everything looks achievable <laughs> from your desk. That's like that's a really good life lesson. Uh, okay, so we've got tools, we've got team, we've got time. And I think throughout yes. this, we've mentioned a few of the the ways that this really does apply to any type of research. But do you have anything you want to add there in terms of somebody at the bench, somebody at the computer? How can they incorporate some of these uh, guidelines to help them in their research? Yeah, absolutely. Like, as we said at the beginning, not everybody is going to find themselves, you know, out on a, on a research, research ship in the middle of the Atlantic or, you know, measuring bat echolocation in Peru, you know, we don't all get to those very exotic locations, but we, most of us will spend a lot of time in the lab and a lot of time in the library or at the office, but the same principles apply no matter what you're turning your hands to. So if you can make sure that you have the tools that you've thought about, what do I actually need to achieve a project? And whether that tool is a particular piece of computer software or a certain amount of laboratory supplies or new laboratory equipment, thinking through those in a very structured approach uh, and defining what actually can make me most efficient and optimize my work uh, can really help you to be more successful in the lab or in the office. What's about, what this is really about is about planning more so than, you know, the, the specifically it's something that is exclusive to field research. When it comes to a team, we all work with a team, whether it's just yourself and your PhD supervisor or your research supervisor, or whether it's other lab staff or a wider research cohort. I know you guys had a, a recent podcast um, all about research as a team sport. You know, we don't do this in, in isolation. We are always trying to accumulate skills and you know, make sure that my samples come in at the time when the lab can take them and when they're not backlogged from an, an, another research project. All of those team building and team management skills are really, really crucial because we don't work. We're not, you know, you know, the 1900s style of researcher who was, you know, kind of just a very wealthy person with access to facilities and, and they did it in, in their homes or in their private laboratories. No, we work with people. And even if you're in commercial laboratories, teamwork is absolutely crucial. So thinking about how can I be a good team leader and a good team player are really important. Yeah, and I think with field research, you're just required to think through these topics. When you're in yeah. the laboratory and you're out of a reagent, you can walk down the hall maybe and borrow it. So you're not forced yeah. to make that same type of planning. But but it would really benefit people to to think through their uh, requirements for what they need, the team they need, uh, the amount of time their experiments are going to take. Because I think yeah. having having that type of focus is is really going to help speed up the research and the experiments and to avoid some of these delays that that do afflict a, a laboratory researcher or a computer researcher um, by not planning ahead you get to step four in the experiment you don't have the reagent you need and as you go find it your cells die or you know you lose the time point that you needed and so i, I do think these are skills that would be beneficial to anybody to develop yeah, absolutely. I suppose the difference is in the field, you're not as as buffered from the negative effects exactly. of lack of planning as you are to a degree in the lab. But by treating your laboratory work or your desk based research as though as though you faced some of these logistical challenges that we know from the field can actually improve you within the confines of the lab building. Well, that is that is so excellent, and I, I assume that some people listening are going to want to be able to find some of the resources that you mentioned and to maybe reach out to you online. Where can they find your work, and where can they find you? 
that would be great. So I had a book come out just earlier this year. It's called Field Work Ready and it's published by Wiley and you can get it on the Wiley website. Just search Field Work Ready and we have, they've given us a discount code, which is pretty nice. It's FWR35. And that really, I suppose, expands on these topics that we've talked about here today. And it goes into a bit more detail about other aspects such as health and safety, li- liaising with people outside of your lab group and then specific fieldwork skills. I also have a website called fieldwork-ready.com and I give seminars and talks and training to PhD and graduate students. So maybe we can help you develop these skills or address the challenges from people's specific research projects. And, you know, I'm happy to be emailed anytime at fieldworkready at gmail.com. That's excellent. And so for anybody who is listening from the field and they didn't get a chance to jot that down, we will post links in our show notes. Thank you, Sarah, so much for taking the time. This is really useful information. Thanks so much, Dan. And I really appreciate your podcast. I became an avid podcast fan when I was doing field research as part of my PhD. I couldn't take the long driving listening to radio any longer. So I have to get into podcasts. So I've really enjoyed your episode so far. All right, Dan, that was that was really fantastic. I, I've certainly said so on the show before that if I could go back and do it all over again and start graduate school, I would do field work. Josh, I am so happy to tell you, you can go back to graduate <laughs> school and start over again. I'm sure they'd have you. I mean, let me be clear. I am not going to go back and start graduate school ever again. But if I had Dr. to... Dr. Dr. Joshua Hall. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There is something really compelling about being outside and learning about things that, that we do for hobbies, right? You go hiking, I garden. There's there's so much in the outdoors and about the world that I think would be really fascinating. People who love animals, people who love insects, people who love the ocean. There are so many opportunities to do field research. And what I love about Dr. Vero's work is she's helping you to be successful at that. I, I kind of wish there were the parallel in the laboratory. Um, and we've tried to bring you some of those voices as well. But I think it's, it's such a great thing that she's doing. Well, I think there's so much to learn here, Dan. So many lessons from field work where the level of organization required, the level of planning required to successfully execute your experiments, uh, be prepared for your trip. Um, I mean, it's critical when you're out off the grid, you know, in, in my experience working in the lab, if I forgot to order the tack polymerase or I ran out of, of Petri dishes or tubes, I could walk down the hall and, and borrow some, right? But you can't do that when you're out in the middle of, when you're out in the middle of the field site. The trouble is, Josh, that when something goes wrong in the lab, like you forgot your Petri dishes or you ran out, it's usually not a story that you get to brag about around the bar later, uh, running into a bull in the field, a little more exciting. Although you've had you've had some experiences in a BSL-3 that are worth talking about. That's true. I'll have to do a whole episode on my adventures from the BSL-3 back in grad school. Now that the statute of limitations has run out. <laughs> I think that's right. Josh, what would you keep in your everyday carry for the lab? For the traditional bench lab? You'd have, you'd have a Sharpie. I'd have my Sharpie. I'd have my timer. Timer, got to have a timer. I'd have my neck pillow. <laughs> Your neck pillow for what? <laughs> you know, you're sitting at those uh, lab stools for long enough. You want to rest your head. You know, your neck gets tired. I don't remember this. I don't remember my neck getting tired. You know, Dan, actually, I could really tell you what would be in my everyday carry, but it would be, it would really date myself when I would think about what was actually in my everyday carry. I would say, oh, it was my iPod shuffle. Yeah, I was going to say, most of the things that you're going to be able to list are in your phone or in your watch <laughs> my now. My flip phone. Yeah. yeah, actually, it's very true. Most of what's in my everyday carry, my iPhone will take care of. Yeah, your timer. Give me a break. <laughs> timer, calculator, camera. Siri, set a timer. Done. <laughs> well, Josh, if people want to learn more from Dr. Vero and find her online, I just want to remind everybody, you can go to www.fieldwork-ready.com. Um, and her book, Fieldwork Ready, an introductory guide to field research for agriculture, environment, and soil scientists, is available from Wiley. We'll put a link in the show. And you can get a discount until December if you use the code FWR35. All right, Dan. That sounds great. Well, if you have feedback for this episode or you have a question or a topic idea for a future episode, we would love to hear it. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. You can send us a tweet at hellophd.com. 
If you like the show, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting platform. We love getting your feedback, and it helps new listeners find the show. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would appreciate the beer money, and thanks to the ongoing support from all of our patrons. Josh, it's been good seeing you in the flesh, and I have to say that uh, one bonus of getting together is your wife just brought out some cookies, so I'm going to go finish a cookie that she gave me. (laughs) Give you a cookie, Dan. Exactly. We'll see you next time. Bye. This week, we explore the great outdoors and share three T's of successful field work. Stay with us. Including Mr. T. (laughs) A pity the fool. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.